people like me, bookkeepers and accountants can sit at a computer literally for hours without standing up and taking a break. So even something as simple as setting your timer on your phone. And for me, it's every 90 minutes. I set that timer. I get up and give myself a 15 minute break, either take a walk or, you know, just have a cup of coffee or do something to just step away from the work. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I am your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a fun one. Our guest has led the accounting departments of Fortune 500 companies like Paramount Pictures, Texaco, and Intuit, and taught for more than a decade at UCLA+. Plus, She's the author of Mastering QuickBooks and runs her own consulting business. Crystal Lynn Shelton, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Michael. I am excited to be here. Yes. Well, it's our pleasure to have you. And and as I just read, quite quite an interesting career that you've had. And before we get into everything, I'd love for you to share your career journey leading up to this point. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I started in the corporate world working for Fortune 500 companies, and I really enjoyed it. I moved up the ladder fairly quickly for the most part and was managing accounting departments at the companies that you mentioned. And after several years of doing that, I started to reach burnout primarily because of the long hours. I pretty much put in probably about 65 plus hours each week, six to seven days a week. And so I knew I needed to look for other opportunities. One of the projects that I was tasked with at one of these companies required me to actually train my staff on how to use a new accounting software. And at the time it was SAP. So I took on that project and fell in love with teaching and training. So I decided to pursue my certification in QuickBooks. And as you mentioned, uh, my actual first uh, training job was adjunct instructor at UCLA Extension, which I am still there today and enjoy thoroughly. Nice. And and how did it then go from uh, your that to your consulting business. Tell us a little bit about your consulting business. Yes. So in January of 2010, I decided to leave the corporate world. Um, I would say probably three, at least three years prior to that, I had been building up my business part time. So I was seeing clients on the weekends and after hours and primarily providing business coaching and consulting uh, in the area of finance primarily. So I would help business owners set up their books in QuickBooks, teach their staff or teach the business owner how to manage those books, and then provide um, either monthly or quarterly reviews to make sure they were staying on track. And at that time, I also provided monthly bookkeeping services for, you know, those businesses that weren't interested in doing their books, as well as managing their payroll. Mm, very nice. What, what, what was, when, you, when you were starting out your business, what were, what were some of the highs and lows? Love to hear those. Yeah, highs and lows. <laughs> well, um, let's start with the lows. <laughs> no, um, this isn't really pertaining to starting a business. It's just really, you know, the amount of stress that comes with, you know, the day to day of working for someone else or, you know, working for yourself. I, I actually encountered some health challenges that I had to deal with. And it was primarily due to just all the stress that came with working in corporate for so long. I um, literally took just a two-week break between corporate 
and going full steam ahead with my consulting business. And in that two week time period, my body just sort of shut down. And so um, I had to come to grips with the fact that I wasn't taking very good care of myself and was just working um, way too hard. And I know that, you know, as a business owner, you know, many of your, the folks in the audience here also can probably relate to, you know, putting everything you've got into building your business and not having much time for self-care. So I would just say that you've got to take time out to take care of yourself or there will be no business. And that's, that's really the reality that I came to. Wow. And, and how, what was, what was the journey to overcome it for yourself? For me, just implementing, you know, I was pretty good about exercising and going to the gym. I actually, that was my stress reliever. So I, I just say um, being consistent with that, doing a good job of taking a break when I need to. Um, many of people like me, bookkeepers and accountants, can sit at a computer literally for hours without standing up and taking a break. So even something as simple as setting your timer on your phone. And for me, it's every 90 minutes. I set that timer. I get up and give myself a 15 minute break, either take a walk or, you know, just have a cup of coffee or do something to just step away from the work. So I would just say finding those things that just time within your day to take little breaks here and there. Um, And then making sure you schedule a vacation. Um, We all need to take that break. um, And it's just it's amazing how refreshed you are when you when you're able to do that and then come back to to your business. So true, so true. We we don't take good enough care often uh, of the most important piece, which is ourselves. Absolutely. Uh, without without good health and mental health and uh, the th- the things, the environment that we need, we can't provide for our business, our families, our friends, uh, and and it, it's come up more and more this whole concept of sitting is worse than smoking, which is crazy, (laughs) but there's more and more statistics coming out. (laughs) And, and so I I know myself, the work that we do is, is we're not throwing around hammers or putting up two by fours or digging ditches. Like our our body Mm -hmm. is just sitting like jello all day and it's really unhealthy. So I love that. Set the timer, get up from the desk. I know that's been one of the things I've tried to implement myself mm-hmm. is just little bits, just to get up, go do something, bend over, pick something up. I got small kids, so it's <laughs> <laughs> never ending. And that in itself, they're keeping me young. Exactly. Uh, keeping me healthy with picking up after them. So the health was, you got that taken care of, and it is miraculous how the body knows, right? It just knew that it's like, okay, I need to shut down because you've, you've given me this opportunity. But then as you started your business, did you run into any obstacles or was it all just smooth sailing right up to the top? I would say that, you know, the main obstacle with starting my business was uh, my very first client happened to be um, one of those clients that I define as a bad client. (laughs) Um, And so I wasn't familiar with that concept and just thought, you know, there's going to be clients that are going to be difficult to work with. And that's just part of, you know, the whole process of having your own business. But in making that mistake, I was dealing with a client who would email me at 10 o'clock at night. And then I'd get a text message the next morning asking me if I received the email. So um, you have those clients that expect you to be on call 24-7, 365. And it's just about setting uh, boundaries, right? So, So for me, what I didn't realize at the time is that I needed to set expectations of what my work hours are. And also what I have in place now, which is a communication policy, which basically just states, you know, when we receive an email or a phone call from you, we will respond to you within 24 hours. Now, typically, if a call comes in or an email comes in during business hours, then 
they'll probably get a response the same day. But I didn't realize that I needed to set those type of um, parameters up front with clients. And so that was a learning curve for me. Um, and so, yeah, that that's one of the main challenges that comes to mind when I was first starting out. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a big one, and and uh, without setting those boundaries, it can be really challenging. And 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 often, the we've talked about it many times on the show that the type of people that are in this industry are very caring people mm-hmm. and want to help. And so it's a very 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 slippery slope. But it, and it feels good probably in the start. Oh, I helped this person. You know, they were having an emergency or what they thought was an emergency. I was able to alleviate that. Mm, I feel good. But if, you know, all of a sudden that can become a nightmare. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> trying to solve these things. And, and so love how, how you've turned that around. How do you manage client relationships? Um, were you always good at it? Did you make mistakes along the way? I'd be curious to know how you deal with that. So managing clients' relationships, I pretty much, I am a people person by nature. And, you know, I would say in the beginning, I would offer um, a free consultation to clients. And typically, it would be 45 minutes to an hour of my time. And while that works, for the most part, um, in some respects, you have people that are Really, they just want that 45 minutes to an hour and they have no plans to, you know, continue with the relationship or the business. But what I've learned and what has helped me is I actually almost use those consultations really as sort of an interview to see if I even want to take that person on as a client. And so I'm in the position now where I only want to work with clients who Um, are willing to do the work and who are serious about getting their books in order. Um, I don't deal with or don't like dealing with people who waste my time. And um, so I kind of, it's kind of a weeding out process, if you will, for me as well. Um, and, And it's good, right, for the client as well, because they need to get a feel for how I work and um, what my expectations are you know, from them. So from the beginning, I try to determine whether or not that client is going to be a good fit. And then what I do is just provide them with a clear path of what we will do to help them get to where they need to be with their finances. So um, that's sort of how I manage it. Very nice. Very nice. And and do you feel that and has that evolved for you in your business? Does that, did you start out with those kind of clients more so? And now you've, you've, you've mentioned you've weeded them out. How was the weeding out process? How do you weed them out? I think that um, one of the things that actually I didn't realize it was a mechanism for weeding people out until um, recently is I have a, um, new client intake form on my website now. And so in order to schedule your complimentary consultation, you've got to complete that form. And what's interesting is I've found that people, there are people out there that don't want to take the time to complete the form. And so for me, that's a red flag. Because if you won't take a few minutes to fill out this form to provide me with the information I need to make an assessment, and that way we can spend more of our time in the consultation talking about other things and sort of just um, clarifying some things. If you don't want to take the time up front, then you're not going to take the time that it's going to require to get your books in order. That form has probably saved you a heck of a lot of time. (laughs) Absolutely. But but just keep in mind, going into it, I had no idea that that was going to, it was going to work that way. It's like the surprising (laughs) discovery. Yes, that's right. Well, I used to um, have a similar form on uh, when I was uh, coaching, uh, business coaching, I had a very similar form and it was remarkable what was 
often I could tell just from that form if they would be a great client. So it's it's mm-hmm. it's part of the like you've said that whole skin in the game. Right. Uh, we're gonna get, I'm giving up my 30 minutes of time or whatever it's going to be. And if that person isn't going to give up a significant or take that exercise seriously, it was a real indicator, a leading indicator of what what was to come. And so it's these little little secrets that you don't know about until you've actually done it and seen it. But it's very satisfactory when it works to do what it's, you know, you didn't even know that it was going to do, but now it's doing its intended job, which is is self letting people self select. Exactly. I'm someone who doesn't fill out stuff like this. Oh, perfect. You're not, you're not, you know, I'm not a perfect fit for you then, right. you know, really, really powerful. Any other big mistakes that you made along the way or things that you've discovered along the way that really made a big difference in how you run your business? Definitely. I would say um, in the beginning, I wasn't big on networking and marketing. What a surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> Many, you know, bookkeepers and accountants, that's just kind of not our thing. So I relied heavily on uh, referrals for business. And um, luckily, you know, that sustained me for um, several years until I was able to start, um, you know, hiring someone who actually was good at marketing uh, my business and implementing, you know, networking opportunities that I could also participate in. And so how do you feel that it was a mistake not doing that marketing? Did it affect your business in any way? Yeah, it did because it was a struggle um, financially. I struggled to pay my bills and make ends meet. Um, Luckily, I had a spouse who you know, also worked. And so he was able to cover what I was not able to. But I look back on that time and I know that if I had just taken the time out to network and um, also implement some marketing strategies, that I probably wouldn't have struggled as much. And I would have had a constant flow of clients coming my way as opposed to, you know, solely relying on referrals. So true. And it's one of the, the key, we have a, a document that we, we've had for years out there, which is the 10 mistake bookkeepers make in business and how to avoid them. And that's, that's one of them uh, for sure is that it initially it works and you, th- and, and you may have thought that, oh, you know, I've got, and getting, getting referrals, you know, it's just sort of doing itself. And, and you're not a marketer and you're not a, you know, like that's not your thing. Like that's not what you set out in the world to become. So it's natural. It's a very natural problem to have. But then the problem is you don't get enough leads enough. And, and that creates not only the financial challenges, but how you interact with those new potential clients, you know, the prices that you you're able to dictate, right. Uh, being able to be selective with the clients, like it has an impact, a, a massive impact. So you've really nailed it on what the, you know, the solution is. It's like, there's, there's some strategies you could take and it, it's the co- they're not costly, but they cost being uncomfortable right. uh, and doing something that you're maybe not comfortable doing. And, but the payoff is you now know, and unfortunately you're at a place now where you have others that can help and implement those things for you? And have those been helpful, having others do the marketing for you? Yes, absolutely. It's just been a huge um, relief. And, and and keep in mind, I, I participate in terms of just uh, even some of the content I actually provide or write myself because I'm comfortable with it. And I want the marketing to sound like it's, coming from me, you know, it needs to be real close to, you know, my brand, represent my brand well, let me say it that way. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's just nice to have someone who um, knows when it's the right time to post something or have a creative vibe where they can create a nice graphic to go along with the text, right? Doing those things that aren't my, my cup of tea. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, I love that. I love that you shared it. It's one that gets made often and hopefully it inspires 
one of our listeners to do it earlier yeah. in their life and in their business to, uh, to, to, to spur on their growth of their business. I'd love to hear, yeah, you, you have some content around the seven ways to help clients be more successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd love, love to hear your take on, on what, what you do to help your clients be more successful. Yeah, absolutely. So there's obviously a number of ways that, number of things that clients can do to be successful. Um, I would say first, I always recommend that uh, business owners schedule time on their calendar each month. If they're doing their own book, schedule time to complete your bank reconciliations and review your financials. This is something that I actually do as well. And it's, you know, on my calendar on a Saturday morning. It's the first Saturday of every month because by then I'll have all my bank statements. And I think it's just important to take the time out to do that monthly instead of doing the mad dash at the end of the year for tax time, right? Um, So that's one thing I I recommend. Another tip I give is, you know, automate as many tasks as possible. And so I typically will put my clients on QuickBooks and I will connect all of their bank and credit card accounts to that software. What that does is it saves them time that they would have spent manually entering that data into the software. And so um, that's another way for them to just um, save time and and automate that, as well as there's a lot of other tasks that you can um, automate by using accounting software. A big one for business owners is unless you have a bookkeeping or accounting background, which many small businesses do not, do not set up your accounting software yourself. Hire a CPA. Huge mistake. <laughs> yeah. Get the heck out of there. <laughs> and I, the reason is this. I believe in getting started on the right foot, starting off on the right foot. And so if you hire a CPA or an accountant to do the setup and then have them train you to maintain it properly, you are going to be in a much better position. Because I I totally believe that you can absolutely maintain it. I teach my clients all the time how to do this. Or if if you're you have a bookkeeper and you want me to train them, then you know we do that as well. So it doesn't have to be the business owner, but I just think um, it's better to have someone who has experience uh, to set it up so that you know it's correct before you start managing your day to day in it. So true. And, and that's, that's a piece that it can't be said enough Mm -hmm. that if there's one thing to be talking to a business owner, that's either in business for a long time, if they, if they're inside of that, to get it done, to, to start off on the right foot or get it done correctly, because it's one of those things that never gets better unless it's been set up correctly. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Another tip that I'll give and something that I see far too often is the commingling of business and personal accounts. Please, please (laughs) set up a separate bank account, checking account and savings account for your business. Um, Too many business owners don't know what's going on with their business financially because they've got everything mixed, personal and business in one account. And you'll never know what's happening with your business if you don't start tracking everything separately. That's a big one for me. (laughs) Messy, messy. Yes. I recommend to business owners that They try to use as little cash as possible. Um, I recommend that you actually use credit and debit cards to pay for the majority of your expenses. This will ensure that you always have a record. Um, One of the things that's challenging for many people, including myself, is keeping track of, you know, paper receipts. 
And while you need those or should have those as your backup for an expense, if you use a debit card or credit card, you know that it's been recorded and you will have it on a statement that you can actually look at and ensure that it gets tracked on your profit and loss statement. As opposed to using cash or something along those lines. Exactly, which, you know, unless you keep that receipt and you're good about doing that, you'll, you won't have track of that. Exactly. I um, also recommend that at least once a year, if not more often, you schedule a tax planning session to strategize on tax deductions and and, in different ways that you can maximize your bottom line, your profits. So I actually did this for the first time last year and it was terrific. You know, I, I'm a CPA, but I don't do taxes. And I've always had someone to do my taxes. And I've never had anyone to provide tax planning strategy um, until I tried it last year. And so I provided my current financials. And this person went through it line by line, um, asked me, you know, questions about my income, my expenses, uh, my two, three, five-year plan. And it was just a terrific 90-minute session that gave me so much insight into different strategies and things that I can do to either minimize my tax bill or, you know, um, just take advantage of the expenses that I have and, and what to do with those. I love it. And the last tip that I have, Michael, for business owners is if you can apply for a business credit card or even a personal credit card, but use it only for business expenses. And um, one of the benefits of having a new credit card is a lot of companies, if you've got pretty good credit, will give you a 0% or a really low introductory rate. I like using credit cards because it keeps really good track of all my expenses. So at the end of the year, I get a year in summary um, from the company and it's sort of a one-stop shop for all my expenses. So I don't have to go looking for receipts or looking at three different bank accounts to see uh, what my expenses were for the year. And so I, I recommend that if, if that's an option for you. Mm-hmm. And it, it certainly keeps keeps the bill down because you as a bookkeeper don't have to separate those things exactly. and question them and all that good mm-hmm. stuff. Absolutely. Well, these are great and uh, lo- absolutely love these uh, for all of us as business owners, but as well, great, great conversation for our listener to take to their clients and, and, and share and talk about these things. And is there, uh, I'd love for you to share if our listener wanted to use that as a reference, uh, any content, they can go to your website. We'll have that link in the show notes, of course, mm-hmm. um, at com. That's where you Uh, keep most of your content, I would imagine. Yes, I actually have a special page for podcasts. So like you said, crystalandshelton.com backslash podcasts. Nice. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, you also mentioned something called Financial Fear Factory. What is that? So Financial Fear Factor. Oh, Factor. Um, Yes. Yes, Factor. So basically, a lot of clients (laughs) that come... That's funny. That's like... (laughs) I'm like, financial fear factory. I'm like, interesting. (laughs) (laughs) That's a different ride. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) You know, many of the people that come to me have a fear of not being able to manage their books. And it's just basically they have a limiting belief that they're not good with numbers, right? Right. Where does this come from? You know, I was one of these people that struggled with math in grade school. 
I mean, struggled. My report card would have all A's and there was a guaranteed B on there for math. It really was. And one of the things that people don't realize is bookkeeping is just basic addition and subtraction, right? Accounting software does the rest. And so I help clients basically to overcome this fear by simply through some coaching of just basic bookkeeping 101. So for example, words like assets, liabilities, accounts payable, right? Those can be broken down into layman's terms. Um, There's a lot of confusing accounting jargon out there, and it can be intimidating to someone who doesn't have the bookkeeping and accounting background that, you know, we have. And so this is something that is a common theme throughout my books and my online courses and my one-on-one coaching sessions is I break things down into easy, simple to understand language, and I provide real world examples so that the concepts um, my small business owners can easily grasp. I love that. Such, such a great way to educate and empower your clients uh, around their own finances. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Lovely. Well, tell us a little bit. You mentioned your books. We mentioned in the beginning and we've talked a little bit about it, but tell us a little bit about Mastering QuickBooks and how you came to to write that. Yeah, great question. Mastering QuickBooks is a, I guess we're in the fourth edition now. I had to stop and think for a second. Yeah. I started writing this back in 2020 was the first edition. And then most recently in um, November of last year, Mastering QuickBooks 2023 was released. All of these books have been available on Amazon and the first three editions were Amazon bestsellers, which were amazing. It was just interesting because I never thought I would write a tech book. (laughs) And the way this came about was really through a DM on LinkedIn. Someone at um, Pack Publishing reached out to me and said they reviewed my profile. They liked my experience and background in accounting and in QuickBooks. And would I be interested in writing a book? Um, So... I, of course, being skeptical, (laughs) Mm -hmm. did some research on the company, and um, I even reached out to an author that had uh, created a book for them for the desktop version of QuickBooks, QuickBooks Desktop. She agreed to meet with me via Zoom. I talked to her. She told me her experience was fantastic, you know, and and the rest is history. It's just amazing. Um, I didn't pursue this opportunity. It actually came to me and it's just been uh, fantastic. Absolutely lovely. Lovely. And and who 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 primarily reads that book? Would it be other bookkeepers or the business owners? Yeah, it's actually a combination. Um, So the book was written. For me, I wrote the book for small business owners with no accounting or bookkeeping background. Um, The book is economical, you know, especially for those startups who can't afford to go to a QuickBooks course or hire me as a coach. You can literally take that book and from start to finish, set up your QuickBooks and learn how to manage it. Surprisingly enough, many of my colleagues who have their own bookkeeping and accounting firms keep it as a desktop reference as well. Because just because you manage accounting and bookkeeping doesn't mean that you are up to date on the latest and greatest features that have been released, especially when it comes to QuickBooks Online. They are making updates to that software every six weeks. It changes. And so many of them have been supportive in uh, recommending that book to their clients and just keeping it nearby in case they have a question that they need to look up about QuickBooks Online. Remarkable. What a, what a great story. What a, a lovely uh, opportunity that came about in your life. Absolutely. 
And what's the future hold for you? What, what's next for you? What are you focused on and thinking about in 2023? So in 2023, I have decided to um, do a lot more uh, podcasts like this. I did one last year and I really enjoyed it and decided, you know what, I need to get out there more and connect with other people. And so for me, just sharing my story and helping as many small business owners and colleagues as I can. So I've committed to a few conferences that I'll be speaking at later this year. And like I said, doing podcasts. And then the big project is just to work on an online course that I have been wanting to do for years. So um, I released the first course, Setting Up, QuickBooks Online a couple of weeks ago. And it's basically a self-paced course. It's a video-based course with me teaching business owners how to set up their books. So I guess you could say it's kind of the video version of mastering QuickBooks. Nice. Um, and I love it. So I spend a lot of my days recording and writing scripts for that course. And it's just a, a fantastic project that I, I'm really, really proud of. I love it. I love it. Well, very exciting. I'm glad to have been a part of your your goals for 2023 of having you on the podcast. This has been absolutely wonderful. And on behalf of our listener, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing some of your wisdom and your journey with us today. Thank you so much, Michael, for having me on. It's been awesome. I have a couple of gifts for your audience. Mm, um, they can actually... Um, go to crystalandshelton.com backslash podcast and download two checklists. I have a closing checklist that is available for download, and I have a checklist that's called Your First Seven Days in QuickBooks. And so they can download one or both of those checklists. And also on that same page, they are able to purchase my latest book, Mastering QuickBooks 2023 for a discount. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that is awesome. I love when our, our our guests, not only do they come and share and bring their time and energy and wisdom to us, but they also bring gifts. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal, and this has been great. Thank you again. Thank you so much. And with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper podcast. To learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.